Today we're in chapter 4 here in the uh, book of 1 Peter. We're going to look at verses 7 through 9. And so let's begin reading together in 1 Peter chapter 4 at verse 7. I'll read to verse 9 and we'll get into our study. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 7 through 9. The Apostle Peter writes, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. And so as we've been looking at First Peter, the apostle has already mentioned the fact that he's writing to a church or churches that are undergoing persecution. And he's been exhorting the believers to remain steadfast in the face of opposition. In order to establish why that is an important thing to do, he's already spoken of how Jesus himself suffered on our behalf. If you look real briefly into chapter 2 for a moment, verses 20 and 21, I'd refresh your memory by drawing your attention to those verses where it says, For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer for it, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So he's already pointed out that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered on our behalf, and therefore we should follow his example. By following his example, one who's already suffered on our behalf, this will enable us to endure our times of pain and our times of suffering and the variety of things that we go through as believers. The times when people speak poorly of us, they gossip about us, or the times that they, they confront us to our face, or even the times that you may have a physical attack that takes place because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying what we as believers are intended to do is just continue in doing good, but also to look back at what Jesus Christ has done for us. He is our example, and therefore we ought to follow his example completely. Jesus strengthens us and gives us the power to endure our times of pain. It reminds me of what the writer in Hebrews said in chapter 12 in the book of Hebrews, verse 2, where he's speaking there in verses 1 and 2 as if the Christian life is a race. And he says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so he's saying as if we're running a race, the course is set before us and we're running it with endurance. And as we do so, there's a finish line that, that we can see. And the finish line he's speaking about is Jesus himself. We're looking unto Jesus. He's the one that we're running towards during this race. And as we're running in this race, we're going to run without distraction. The only thing that should be before us is the finish line. So he's saying that, that if we're going to be successful in our life, and endure the suffering that we sometimes will find ourselves in, we need to make sure that we take our, our eyes off ourselves. We need to take our eyes off of our circumstances, our needs, and we need to look unto Him. And the reason we do so is because Jesus is referred to as the author and the finisher of our faith. The word author speaks of Him being the originator of our faith, and the finisher speaks of Him being the one who brings it into maturity and completeness, and therefore, without looking at distractions around us, even when we're reviled, even when people are, are speaking ill of us to our faces or, or behind our back, or when they're hurting us, even when they're doing those things, we're looking beyond what is ex we're experiencing at that moment, looking past it, because we're enduring it because of the joy that is set before us. That's what he had said. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. So Jesus... Uh, endured the agony of the cross because he had the joy of finishing his course. He knew he would finish his course. He also knew he'd obtain salvation and he was going home. And so that should be our motivation, that we should be pleasing to him. What do I run for? Why am I in this race and what is the prize? Well, the prize isn't heaven because heaven is really my home. It became my home when I got saved. Living in heaven is actually a gift. It's an inheritance. It's not a prize that is won by trying hard. And Paul said in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Heaven is our home. 
What I'm running for is the joy of glorifying God by being faithful to Him. And that's why we remain steadfast in the face of suffering. And that's why Peter had already said in verse 1 that we're to arm ourselves with the same mind that Jesus had. What we do is we have a willingness to suffer while doing the will of God because in that way God refines our faith and He grows, up, grows us up as believers. That knowledge is something precious to us but isn't always understood by those who don't know the Lord. And so we've already seen those verses and he's continuing that thought into verse 7 here in 1 Peter chapter 4 by saying, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. So remain steadfast. The end is coming. The end of all things. When he speaks of the end, the end is a word that refers to the result or the goal. It's, it's the end of some condition, some state of being. And what he's saying is that things are going to conclude and it's going to conclude soon. And therefore, when Jesus returns, we ought to look to him because we're going to one day be with him. So if Jesus is returning, how then should we live? Well, we should live as if we believe that Jesus is returning, that he's actually returning to planet Earth. Now, when I first got saved, people were speaking about the fact that Jesus promised to return. It isn't something that was invented in, you know, the 1800s, 1900s. It's, it's something that we find in Scripture. Jesus made those promises. In John 14, for example, verses 1 through 3, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's a promise from the Lord. Jesus taught that while he was still alive on the face of the earth. And he says, I'm going to return. And so he gave us the promise of his return. Not only did Jesus speak concerning his return, but angels reminded us of his return. Because in Acts chapter 1, after that, Jesus had spoken to his disciples. And he had said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. After speaking to them concerning the power that God would give to them so that they could be witnesses to him, the next thing we see in verse 9 is that after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven." So the promise was Jesus saying, I will come and, and receive you unto myself. The angels reminded the disciples. And this promise is something that is referred to throughout the New Testament. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ is intended to stir us with an expectation that results in righteous living. If Jesus is really returning, then it ought to stir us to live in a certain way. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So the return of Christ can happen at any moment and therefore we should be ready at any moment. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. The Lord promises to return for us. It's, it's the hope of the church. It's the expectation of believers. He said he could return and the next prophecy on God's calendar to be fulfilled is the rapture of the church for us to be gone and to be with him. And this is something that was poured into me from the day I got saved. One of my friends, George Adams, I've shared this with you before, but George Adams at that time was living in expectation of the soon return of Christ. And he basically drummed that into me. Jesus is returning. You ought to live as if you expect him to return today. And I can still remember, as I've shared with you before, how that one day he and I were driving to the store, pulled out of the driveway, drove up to a stop sign. I took a left turn. As I took a left turn, my passenger side door swung open. When the door opened up, George, who always had his Bible on him and had his Bible on his lap, when the door swung open, George leaned out with both of his hands over his head holding the Bible. 
And I slammed on the brakes and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I thought the rapture happened and Jesus is a gentleman and he opened my door for me. I'll never forget that. That was his expectation. And the second thought to me was, uh, why was my door left closed? You know, I, I'm not quite sure how that works. But that was the expectation. That's what we were trained in. That's what the Bible teaches. I will come again, receive you unto myself. There where I am, there you may be also. Men of Galilee, why are you looking up into the sky? Jesus said he'd return even as you saw him go. How should we live? We ought to live lives in, prep in preparation. We ought to be live, living lives that, are, that, that really act as if we believe that, that Jesus Christ actually is coming back for us. The end of all things is at hand. How am I to live? Well, I'm to be serious. I'm to be watchful. I'm to be prayerful. I'm to live in such a way as it demonstrates that I actually believe that the Lord is coming. Now, when he speaks about us being serious and watchful in our prayers, to be serious-minded speaks of exercising self-control in my life. The return of Jesus isn't intended to make me into a date-setter or a disaster hound. It's intended to encourage me to, to patiently wait for Him, to be prepared that I might see Him. You see, the Bible speaks concerning the church as if the church is the bride of Christ. Paul speaks of himself as a father who has espoused his virgin bride to the husband and therefore he has a protective interest for this virgin bride who will one day be married to the husband and he tells us in Ephesians 5 that the husband is Jesus himself and so we the church the body of Christ are called by various metaphors in scripture but one is called the bride of Christ and the Bible teaches us that we are to be prepared to meet him and therefore we make ourselves prepared through the works that we do that demonstrate that we anticipate being with him. I've done a lot of weddings in my day and I can tell you this the brides always are ready they're always prepared I mean when they come marching down that that this aisleway here comes from those two double doors in the back. And that music starts, you know, and the wedding march begins, dum, 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 for the husband <laughs> to be the victim. And the doors swing open, and here comes the death march, I mean the uh, bridal march. She always looks good. She always looks beautiful. The bride has prepared herself. She's ready. She's meeting her husband. It's her day. She always looks good. You know, you ladies who are married, you know that's true. You went out, you found a dress to get married in, a nice dress, a beautiful dress, a dress you spent a lot of money, or your parents did, or whomever, a lot of money on, bought that dress. You bought a dress maybe a little smaller than what you usually wear, because it's your wedding day. And you can always let it out a little bit if you don't meet your goal. But you bought that dress. Now, husbands are different. We rent a tuxedo. That should tell you something about our commitment, but that's a different story. <laughs> You bought that dress, a beautiful dress. You got the veil or whatever it is that you wanted. And the music plays and the people stand and the doors spring open. And there you come down that aisle. And your husband up here, a.k.a. victim, is standing here watching. And as he sees you coming up, there's tears in his eyes. And, and everybody's, you know, just, oh, it's, you prepared yourself. You got ready. You didn't come out all messed up. That's the next day. You came out looking good. You came out looking fine, didn't you? Because it's your day. Your hair's done up. The makeup's just right. The dress, everything. It's perfect. Why? Because you took the time to prepare yourself because you're meeting your groom and you wanted to be prepared. We can take that and use that as an illustration in our life. How then should we live? What should we be like? We should be prepared. We should be ready. We want to see him. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure, we're told in 1 John 3, 3. Not only are we serious-minded, but we're also going to be prayerful. We're going to be watchful. We're calm and collected as we wait. We're people of prayer depending on God, waiting for him to deliver us. In Mark 13, 33 through 37, it says, Take heed, watch and pray. For you do not know when the time is. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. And therefore watch, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. 
That's why he says, be serious, be watchful, and be prayerful. Wait it on the Lord who's to come. Now, in the midst of all this persecution and trying times that the believers are going through, the apostle needs to encourage them to make it through by keeping their eyes on Jesus Christ. Now, as they keep their eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they also have duties, they have responsibilities that they are enacting as, they, as they're on planet Earth. They're, they're the church, the body of Christ. How is the body of Christ to act? What is going to sustain them during the times of persecution and trying times? What is it going to be that I need to keep me strong? Well, he says in verse 8, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Under persecution, they're going under persecution. So under persecution, it's easy to begin caring more about your own needs. Under trying times, it's easier for you to begin caring for your own needs, your own wants, your family's needs. And so he's saying, listen, you're supposed to have fervent love for one another. And this is above all things. Because love is a supreme virtue. Love is the identifying mark of a genuine believer of Jesus Christ. A new commandment give I unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The Bible makes it very clear. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear that, that we are to love one another. And you find that throughout the scripture. Colossians 3.14 says, Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. The body of Christ is one body, and therefore the body is knit together in the love of God. And during times of hardship and persecution, rather than caring simply for our own needs, we care for the needs of other people. That's what he's called us to do. In 1 John 4, 7, the scripture says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He goes on to say, He who loves not knows not God, for God is love. It is the identifying mark of the believer. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said in John 15, 12. And so the Lord has called us to have love. And it's not just this sentimental, emotional, but he says, above all things, have fervent love, a fervent love. That fervent love isn't an option. It's central to our faith and it identifies us as believers. This love is one that is passionate and strong. He's already spoken of, of loving in a fervent fashion, and that word fervency, speaking of its intensity, speaks of it being a maximum effort. And in other words, put all your effort into this one thing, that is to love one another. He's already spoken of that kind of love in chapter 1, verse 22, when he said, love one another fervently. So make maximum effort to truly care about one another. Your faith is going to be stretched to the limit to love, in spite of insults, in spite of injury, in spite of misunderstandings. Boy, is that a message that the church is in need of remembering in these last days. We live in such a fragmented society, don't we? We live in a society that, well, that, that families break up very easily and very quickly. Promises that were made to love and cherish forever until death Parts us are just words that are spoken in front of people on that occasion, but not necessarily that which rules our life and rules our marriages. Some people look at marriage as if it's something that you, well, you have a startup marriage, you try it. If it works out, fine. If it doesn't, you can always start again with somebody else with the lessons that you've learned. And that's the mentality that many people have brought into their marriages. Sadly, they... They break one another's hearts and then they break the hearts of the children that they abandon as they pursue their own courses of happiness. And the children who are raised in homes that have been busted up like that don't really understand what love is. They don't know what men really are. They don't know that men are supposed to keep their promises. They don't know that wives are supposed to keep their promises. They simply know that these two didn't. So they grow up in a, in a home that has been fragmented and it's very sad and it's painful and this is no judgment, it's just a fact, it's a reality. That's true. 
A lot of broken hearts, a lot of broken hearted children, a lot of anger that continues throughout not only childhood but into adulthood. A lack of trust for one another, a lack of willingness to, to pour out or fervently pursue because we've seen that, that love can hurt sometimes. At least that's how we have interpreted love. It's a hurtful thing, not necessarily something that's a healing thing. So hearts are broken. And we're afraid to unite with people. We're afraid to unite even with those who are closest to us. We're afraid to disclose ourselves. We're afraid to bear our souls. We're afraid to trust and hold nothing back. And then you get saved and you get into a church and you hear messages about loving fervently the maximum effort and, and you do your best to do that, but you never really seem to think that you've ever really grabbed hold of that message. What does it mean to love fervently? You know, I can speak to a left side of the audience and I can speak to the right side of the audience and the right side of the church here may never meet the person on the left side of the church. Never has opportunity or ever takes opportunity to. We can actually segmentize ourselves into the preferential seating that we are disposed to. So I choose to sit here and they choose to sit there. Never the two shall meet. So how does it work in love and what does it mean to fervently love one another when you're really strangers in reality? Well, you make a maximum effort. You get involved, you serve. You get to know people. You, you reach out across the aisle. You know, there are times when, when we say, okay, take the hand of the person next to you, and that's the only time somebody's actually had somebody else hold their hand in the whole week. It's the first time somebody actually reached out and touched them because they live alone. They're by themselves constantly. Nobody ever reaches out and touches them at all. So for them, it's a great thing. For you, it may be an uncomfortable thing. But for others, it's something that, that matters because this is human contact. I haven't really had this, and it's nice to have even if it's just for a moment, and even if it's simply to remind me that I actually am part of something much bigger than my individual life. Love. Love one another fervently. I ask the Lord, can you please help me to understand what that means, Lord, to have a passion and intensity to stretch out to the limit? What does that really mean? And, and you know what the Lord did? He brought to mind something that I see, I see all the time. He brought to me, uh, to my mind, the love that my son David has for his daughter, Bella. My little Bella, Isabella, Bella, turned three years old on the 28th of August, three years old. And, you know, as she became three, you know, naturally there's all the, the honor given to this uh, three-year-old. And so we went to Chuck E. Cheese I only go for Bella and my grandchildren. I wouldn't go for anything, anything else. I don't, you know, rats singing scare me. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese. And she had her little party and she was the guest of honor along with another little uh, child that was having their birthday there and the singing and all of that. And it was a lot of fun for her. But then again, she had to have another little get together and finally she had another get together and by then she was kind of tired of all of her parties and this and that and she's already partied herself to death. She's three years old, you know. And yet, all this love and everything, I was watching my son David, I couldn't help but notice. And, and I spoke to him and I've told him this, but I'll say it openly to you. You know, in, in my life, a lot of people know that David Rosales loves his wife and loves his children. Every, everybody who knows me knows that's true. But I told my son David, you know what? You put me to shame when it comes to loving a baby. My son David loves that little girl with an intensity and a passion and a maximum effort that I have never seen in another man in my entire life, including myself. I have never seen that kind of devotion, that kind of love, that kind of sacrifice, that kind of willingness as I've seen in my son with his little girl. I am so in the Lord proud of that young man for that love he has for her. And God used him as an example to me of what it means to love with passion and to the maximum effort because that's what he does. He loves that baby. There's nothing that he wouldn't do for her that is good for her. He would give up anything for her. He does everything for her. He loves her. And the Lord was saying, that's an example of love. Why don't you see it and use it yourself? Why don't you learn to love like that? Because that, to me, has been a living epistle. That's watching this man raising this little girl. He's a single father. Watching him with he and his friend, his girlfriend, who's a, a, a loving woman, by the way, and loves her baby, too. But I see David with, with Bella more than I see uh, his girlfriend with her. 
And I'll have to tell you, it, it touches my heart to see that, to see God love through my son. What an example to me. What a fervency that he has. And that's what the Lord has called me to. God has called me to love with a fervency. You see, when you love with that kind of love, you actually will overlook certain things. It says, love will cover a multitude of sins. When you have a great love for, for somebody, then the petty annoyances and the various things that can destroy relationship are dealt with. They aren't so large. It, it, it turns out they're not that big a deal. You actually are able to go through those things and these differences are kept at a minimum. And what he's telling us to do is to choose to love because love preserves the unity of the body of Christ. So resist the, the, uh, the temptation to become petty and self-centered. I've had people who've been upset at me because I didn't hug them. I didn't even see them. But they've been angry at me. You didn't hug me. And they left the church and they let me know of how unloving I am. <laughs> I'm unloving, that's true. But I didn't see them. And, and, and we can be petty and we can get upset and we can make issues over things that just do not matter. You see, in persecution, the fact is, is these people had something going in their life that was a lot more important. They were surviving. And when you're surviving, then the petty things that would normally cause d discord are, are dealt with. And that's why he says love covers a multitude of sin. It's not that love is going to forgive sin. It's not, he's not saying that, that you ignore it. He's, he, he's saying in relationship between me and somebody else, He's saying that my love for that person is going to give me the opportunity to overlook the things that have been done. Yes, we deal with the sin, we deal with issues, but it doesn't divide us. And, and in my relationship with somebody, I, I'm to love them enough to allow them to be human beings. Not only that, he goes on to say in verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Now under Moses' law, the Jews were to be gracious to strangers. They were to be hospitable. In Deuteronomy 10, 19, it says, Therefore love the stranger. You were strangers in the land of Egypt. So this concern for others is to be out of a love for people. So be, con so be concerned for other people. Have a hospitable heart. Be generous in your spirit. Once again, my David, I'm going to use him as an example again because he's been a good lesson to me. He was around four or five years old. We had gone to to uh, Ensenada to do some ministry. I took my family with me. On our way home, we stopped in Tijuana. As we were there in Tijuana, we started walking, and the kids had never been there, so we were just walking in this one area. And as we were walking, David was next to me, as he always was. And as we were walking, we walked by a lady, and I noticed that David was looking at this lady because the lady was seated with her back against the wall. She was holding a baby. She had a can in front of her, and she needed help. And as we walked by, I was watching my son. And as I watched my son, I watched him look at the lady. And, and I'll be honest with you, we kept walking. As we kept walking, we got to a corner, which was about 20 yards from where the lady was seated. We crossed the street. Then we began to make our way back down the other side towards in, in the same direction where this lady was. And all this time, I'm watching my son as he keeps looking back. We crossed the street. I could see him looking towards her. We crossed and started walking again, and he's still looking in her direction. And finally, I stopped directly across from this woman, and I stopped and I said to my son, David, David, what's wrong? You're not happy. You're sad, aren't you? And he looks at me, and he said, yes, Daddy. And I said, why? I said, is it because of that lady with that baby and she needs help? And he said, yes, Dad. And I said, do you want to help her, Dave? And he said, yes. So I put my hand in my wallet, pulled out some money, handed it to him, and I said, go give her something. So he goes running up to the corner, crosses the street, crosses, runs, and I see him put this money in her hand. He comes running back with the biggest smile in his face. And the Lord spoke to my heart. To this day, spoke to my heart. He said, that's the heart that you're supposed to have, a heart that sees pain and wants to help. Be hospitable. It's easy to walk past. Be hospitable. Care for those in need. Remember who you are and where you've come from. Don't forget. When you have a brother in the context, you have a brother or a sister who's in need, a genuine need, and their persecution was causing them to lose everything, he said, take care of them and do so without grumbling, without grumbling. Because you can do something good, but under your breath saying, man, why do I have to do this again? Where's somebody else? How come they caught me? You know, you can grumble over that. 
Again, my David is very generous. He's so generous he'd give everything I own away if he could. <laughs> he was the kind of kid that when his friends would come over, he'd go running up to the, to the cupboard and open it up and he'd say, do you want something, friend? Do you want something to eat? And he'd pull things out. Daddy, can you make this soup for them? I mean, he was just that way. He'd give away my house if he could. You know, very generous. But that's what he's talking about. Have a hospitable heart. And don't grumble about it. Don't be making issues over it. Don't be upset about it. You need to have an attitude that goes beyond um, just self-satisfaction. It needs to go beyond that. And that attitude goes beyond providing food or a place to stay because what you do is you give out of a sincere heart. You need to have a generous spirit that's grounded in the love of God and the love for others. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. As much as lies within you, do good unto all men, especially to the household of faith, Paul told the Galatians. Have a heart to give. Have a heart to care. Have a heart that loves. Be hospitable without grumbling. Have a fervent love, because love covers a multitude of sin. Have an expectation because the Lord Jesus Christ is returning and therefore be watchful and therefore be prayerful and be ready because he's even at the door. And love is that which cements us together. Love makes it possible for us to withstand persecution. Love enables us to live in harmony. Even again, as it says in Colossians 3.14, clothe yourselves with love which binds us together in perfect harmony. It's the love of God, the love of the Spirit, the love for one another, the love that came from God that is extended to other people that God honors. And in doing so, the church will have an impact in a world that doesn't even think that Jesus is returning. But we know that he is. He's even at the door and his reward is with him. And one of these days before too long, that trumpet will sound. The voice of the archangel will ring out and we will be with him to behold his face forever and ever and ever in unity with him, in love with him, in a home prepared especially for us. And it comes because we had faith in Jesus Christ. He held fast to us and we held fast to him. Love one another fervently.